Antonio Barbo Barbo and Nathan Pop are charged with first-degree intentional homicide for allegedly bludgeoning to death 78-year-old Barbara Olson, Barbo's great-grandmother, at her Sheboygan Falls home in September 2012 with a hammer and hatchet. She invited them into her home, and as she turned her back to call Barbo's mother, Barbo hit her on the head with the hatchet. He said he then ran to the bathroom as he was feeling sick, but that when he emerged, he saw Pop hit the woman with the hammer multiple times. A psychiatrist has testified Barbo has cognitive issues stemming from him being struck by a car when he was 10, possibly affecting his behavior. Barbo tried reading an apologetic statement but started crying, passing it off to his defense attorney who also had to fight back tears while doing his best to read the statement. Careless, careless killer. Careless. Barbo will be eligible for parole in 2048 when the now 14-year-old is 50. Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik Cassie Jo Stoddard was a high schooler homesitting for her aunt and uncle in September 2006. When she had a couple of friends over, she would have never imagined it would have led to her death. Cassie invited her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, over to the residence that evening. He stated that the two of them also invited Tori Adamchik to the house to hang out. Tori came there with Brian Draper. Cassie was classmates with Brian and Tori. Matt told the police that Brian and Tori hung out for a couple of hours before they left. About 15 minutes later, there was a power cut at the residence. When Matt called his mother to ask if he could stay over for the night with his girlfriend, she said no and picked Matt up. Brain police that the two of them unlocked one of the doors at the house to come back and scare Cassie later. He also said that they wore masks, black clothing, and gloves and carried knives with them. Both of them were 16 years old at the time. Tori Adamchik and Brian Draper brutally stabbed Cassie Joe Stoddard approximately 30 times. Brian claimed that Tori was the one who stabbed Cassie, but later admitted to taking part in it because he was scared Tori would turn on him. But the videotape seemed to place the blame firmly with the two of them. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body. Tori. Tori and Brian also compared themselves to other famous serial killers. With the videotape making for a crucial piece of evidence, both Brian and Tori were charged with Cassie's murder and were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder and 30 years to life for the conspiracy charge. Gavin Ramsey On April 9, 2018, police officers at the Wadsworth Police Department received a call from the family of Margaret Douglas. The caller reported that the 98-year-old grandmother, who lived alone, had not been heard from. The officers went to her home to perform a wellness check, but did not find her. The police began searching for Margaret Douglas. They were joined by her nephew, Howard Leisure, and his wife, Cindy, in the evening. When Howard went to check his aunt's closet, he made a horrifying discovery. Underneath a pile of clothing was Margaret Douglas' lifeless body. The way her clothing was disheveled and torn in some places suggested that she could have been raped. A trauma on her neck also suggested she might have been strangled. There were also bruises on her head and face. Zachary quickly revealed that his friend Gavin Ramsey was involved in the crime. Moreover, he told the police that they had been involved in other crimes. He said all had been Ramsey's idea. When the police looked at Ramsey's phone, they were shocked to find the photos and videos of the old lady on the gadget. They had been taken from Margaret's house without her knowledge. The police took him into custody, and in the interview room, he began confession. Ramsey admitted that he had snuck into Margaret Douglas' house. When he got inside, he had begun recording her while she slept. However, when she woke up, he forced her onto the ground and strangled her before realizing what he was doing. Ramsey then spent hours taking more videos and photographs of her corpse, including several of a sexual nature. He would then move her into the closet and go back to his home before his parents woke up at 5 a.m. The police arrested him for murder. He was found guilty but could not face the death penalty because he was under 18. Therefore, Judge Joyce Kimbler sentenced him to life without parole. Nathaniel Brazil as a child, Brazil was surrounded by domestic abuse and alcoholism at home, and local police frequently responded to calls from the Brazil residents. May 26, 2000, the last day of school before students were to start their summer break, Brazil was a 13-year-old student at the school. 
Brazel was sent home early for throwing a water balloon. He returned with a gun which he had stolen from a family friend and went to Barry Gruno's English arts classroom demanding to see two female classmates. When Gruno refused to let Brazel speak to them, Brazel shot him point blank in the face and watched him die in front of his classroom door. After the shooting, he ran. Other students testified that he pointed a gun at a teacher as he fled. At his trial, Brazel told the jury he never meant to pull the trigger. He received a sentence ranging from 25 years to life in prison. John Christian This is John Christian, a Murchison Middle School teacher Wilbur Rod Grayson, who was shot to death with a .22 caliber rifle by 13-year-old student John Daniel Christian. Witnesses said Grayson, 29, a first-year English teacher, was sitting on a stool when Christian entered the classroom, raised his father's rifle, and shot Grayson three times. The young killer was the son of George Christian, former White House press secretary under Lyndon Johnson. John Christian spent 17 months in a psychiatric hospital and recovered his mental faculties to the point that he finished law school at the University of Texas and is currently a lawyer in Austin. At John Christian's 1978 hearing, a pair of psychiatrists testified that the 8th grade honors student suffered from latent schizophrenia and that putting him in a juvenile detention center would only increase the severity of his mental illness. Christian told doctors he didn't single out Grayson, despite reports that he was angry about a failing grade. Lionel Tate Lionel's mother, Kathleen, was asked to watch six-year-old Tiffany for the evening. Kathleen and Tiffany's mother had grown up together in Jamaica. Lionel Tate was only 12 years old at the time. After dinner, the children were watching TV, and Kathleen decided to go upstairs for the evening. She yelled downstairs for them to quiet down at about 10 p.m., but did not check on them at that time. It was around 40 minutes later, at approximately 10.40 p.m. when Lionel Tate went upstairs to get his mother and told her that little Tiffany Eunuch was not breathing. He told his mother he had her in a headlock when she smashed her head on the side of a table. He then described her as rolling around on the floor, crying, acting like a baby, and urinating in her pants. When Lionel finally went to get his mother to tell her that the little girl was not breathing, her broken little body was already cold. In 2001, 14-year-old Lionel Tate was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the death of six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch that had occurred two years prior. He was the youngest person in the United States to ever be given that sentence. Joshua Phillips Phillips was a lonely average student who spent much of his spare time watching TV at home. However, he did befriend his eight-year-old neighbor Maddie Clifton to horrifying results. When she came by to play with Phillips on November 3, 1998, they were in the front yard playing baseball when Clifton crossed the street to join him. He claimed to have agreed since both of his parents were at work, but then accidentally hit her in the eye with his ball. Scared of the consequences, he dragged the crying girl into his house and then strangled and hit her with his bat. Desperate to silence her before his father got home, Phillips shoved her unconscious body under his bed. Her mother reported Clifton missing at 5 p.m., but she would never be seen alive again. The 15-year-old was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That was it for today's video. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to our channel and hit the like button.